Hello and welcome to Coach's Decision, a weekly talk show that covers sports topics from the Bay Area and beyond. I am My name is Thomas Todd. I'm joined here on the phone today by my college buddy. He's the sorest loser of them all. It's Daniel Zarchi. How you doing, buddy? I'm good, man. What are you talking about? I haven't lost in a while. You, okay. You and I have lost a couple of things together. Uh, pool, games of pool, let's say. Um... We really we don't go head to head too much. You sometimes make me play a video game, which I don't do particularly well. It rarely and, goes well. You know, you at least last last time you showed me a, a new game, I at least got to be on your team. Um, but I was still a pre- I was a pretty sore loser in that one. So maybe I'm I'm the sorest loser. But what do you think of all this Cam Newton as sore loser? Uh, I, I mean, people already have unrealistic expectations for how people should react after having, you know, the worst news or the worst day of their life. And I just, I think you have to realize that they're human. And, and a lot of this is just people who wanted an excuse to criticize Cam Newton. And, and now they have something legitimate. I mean, quote unquote, legitimate or specific to target. And it's just, you know, now a bunch of old white men can write their columns and then go to sleep happy. Right, and I don't think it's just the old white men, though. I think a lot of Cam Newton's colleagues, a lot of his fellow players, were waiting for him to fail. Because this happened with, uh, you know, in a less successful version, Blake Griffin, where he got every commercial, you know, he got all the Kia commercials, and he's here, and he's there, and he's making all this money. And guys didn't understand why, because he hasn't won a championship. You know, he hasn't done anything. So I think all the brash celebrations um, have come back around on Cam, and people are enjoying watching him fail. So to have him, you know, come out in his morose way and uncooperative with the media way, it just proves what they already wanted him to be. So he's kind of playing into their expectations. Um, not the best yeah, Super Bowl. That doesn't, I mean, that does, certainly doesn't change the way I feel about Cam or, you know, whether I would want him to be the quarterback of my team going forward. Well, yeah, we're always going to enjoy watching him play, and you ha- uh, no matter who you are, player, coach, fan, you have to marvel at what he's able to do on the on the field. But it, it'd be easier to swallow if he was a little more humble in victory and a little more respectful in defeat. Just balance it out a little bit. Um, but there, you know, there was a thing where you know Manning lost the Super Bowl to the Saints, and he didn't shake anybody's hand, and he was seen as a true competitor, and that's just his edge, you know, and that's unfair. Uh, for anyone to make that comparison, you know, anyone who doesn't want to shake hands after a game, I would consider at least some version of a poor sport. But it's unfair that it had to go all at Cam. Um, well, sure, but he, he but, does earn but, it. He does earn it with the Superman and the dabbing and the dancing and the team taking a photograph while the game's still playing. He earned all of that. <laughs> you know, he earned people enjoying watching him lose. Yeah. No. And and it's interesting that when they did stuff like that, they knew that they could really only get away with it as long as they kept winning. And so to that extent, you can kind of say that they knew that they had it coming, you know, if they, if they didn't win. On the other hand, it's, it, it's still just this old white man columnist block that was looking for some way to criticize Cam. And it's, you know, for not playing the game the right way, whatever the heck that means. And I, you know, they're, they're, They've had their fill of writing about Bryce Harper, and now they're just going to write about Cam. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, I hope it gets quashed. I know I saw the the thing where he was actually maybe angered by Broncos corner Chris Harris's comments, which were behind a curtain next to him instead of in a different room, and the media uh, availability wasn't set in different rooms, so that might have affected Cam's mood. I hope we just don't talk about it all summer, and I hope that's not the big story going into the next NFL season because there's so many good storylines that the NFL always brings every year, and I hope that's not one of them. Um, On our show today, we're going to talk more about the Super Bowl. Uh, We're going to jump into a little bit of our San Francisco Giants because there's a few updates there. Uh, There's some basketball I'm going to quiz you on and uh, the Football Hall of Fame class. So stay tuned. We've got some good stuff. Uh, Let's do some housekeeping. You can always find our show, Coach's Decision, on iTunes uh, by searching the name of the show or Thomas Todd. Uh, It'll come up either way. Please subscribe. Send us some love. Make a review. uh, Give us five stars, four stars. Whatever we deserve, give it to us. We'll take it. Uh, You can also find Uh, all the... How do you know that... 
how do you know if they search iTunes, they're not going to find one of the other Thomas Todds? Well, yeah, there, there are, are there are four at least. There are several Thomas Todds, but you'll be you'll be led in the right direction uh, by the logo, Coach's decision. Um, you can also find the show on YouTube. We stream every episode on there. Um, and if you want to show us some true love, we have a couple of sponsors that we have a partnership with. They are called FansEdge.com and Fanatics.com. If you go on those sites, but click through from our website, CoachesDecisionKSCO.com, uh, they will send us a little bit of love every time you make a purchase. So click through CoachesDecisionKSCO.com. Go to FansEdge.com and Fanatics.com. They have tons of swag for every sport and every team. And they're always discounted rates, 20 30 even 40 percent off of retail and market value that's your best place to go if you want gear um show your loved one on valentine's day how much you love how much they love sports all right danny let's bust right back into the super bowl what did you do for this game uh we had a few people over we uh made some chili made some guacamole and kicked back and watched the game it was fun had some friends over well, yeah, you, you've been to my place. You know my friends. I've been I've been to your pad. I know some of your friends. I count myself among them occasionally when we're not arguing. Um, you were invited to come. I was invited. Yeah. No, I, I had to work early that day. I got off just in time to to swing around to KSO contributor Derek Bozo's house and and hang out with him and his his, his girlfriend. I she's a character. I she was bringing out Takati's three at a time, and I thought it was for you know me, her, and Derek, but it turns out they were all for her. <laughs> she, she was enjoying the Super Bowl, and uh, her favorite player is Peyton Manning, but uh, her, her actual favorite player is her iPhone, so uh, <laughs> we had to keep pointing out Peyton Manning. What number is he? Uh, that's a whole a whole long story we won't get oh, into. Oh, well, speaking of Peyton Manning, Peyton Manning is also your favorite player, so congratulations to you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I've, I've been enjoying it. I You know, I took a, a little extra uh, alcohol break after the game to kind of wash have it all wash over me and and enjoy the glory that is Peyton Manning winning his second Super Bowl because I've been in these conversations. I think Peyton Manning's the greatest quarterback of all time, and I think he's the most proficient and effective and intimidating passer I've ever seen. And it really would stink if he had to retire with one Super Bowl, you know, three short of Brady and Bradshaw, two short of Aikman, and, you know, one fewer than Eli, which is always the, the thing trolls bring up to make people angry. Um, so he finishes with the most yards all time, the most touchdowns of all time, and two Super Bowls, which is a pretty good resume, um, considering he reached four Super Bowls and a, and a couple more AFC Championship games. So, what do you think his legacy is? Where does he? I know he's you're a Montana guy because that's your guy, but what what's Peyton's legacy for you? Oh, I think he definitely retires as one of the best quarterbacks of all time. I mean, I, I I'm not the kind of person to engage in, you know, is he is this great quarterback better than this other great quarterback except that Joe Montana is the greatest of all time. So why do you, what, do you, so you never go on the internet is what you're saying? You're not that kind of person? I try to avoid it, you know. <laughs> and rule number one is never tweet, right? Yeah. Um, rule number two is don't I, talk about Fight Club. <laughs> uh, certainly if it involves tweeting, that's, that's for sure. <laughs> never tweet about Fight um, Club. <laughs> but... <laughs> But, no, he's definitely going down with one of the greatest of all time. And, you know, as we talked about on this show a couple of weeks ago, I'm glad he won it, too, because um, I personally couldn't care less what happened in a couple games here and there. And I think that if you look at his body of work, that's the, that's the legacy. And so, basically, I'm glad he won it because now people – won't bring up those things I don't care about. Right, you don't have to hear. You don't have to hear it, and that's where I'm at. I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want to hear how he's one and two. And if he was one and three in the Super Bowl, that's a stain. Like that's an actual stain on a legacy. Reaching four Super Bowls is great, but you know, even John Elway was two and four. Uh, though the rushing game brought him, the running game brought him those last two, and the zero oh and four would have put him on the level of you know uh, the, the Vikings quarterbacks, Fran Tarkenton and. Um, can't remember the name of the fourth guy, but uh, Jim Kelly, guys oh. like that. And you don't want to be in that group. But what's especially silly is that he did nothing. I mean, oh, he did he less than nothing. The, he was the worst player on his own team. And so why is this part of I mean, he was a Hall of Famer well before his body broke down. Um, he was the great, you know, one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time before his body broke down. But why is it that something that happened after he stopped contributing to his team 
will have such a fundamental role in defining his legacy. Because in 20 years, we and, won't remember that he only passed for 140 two. yards. Question two. And question two, isn't that stupid? <laughs> of course it's stupid. But in 25 years, no one's going to remember that he only threw for like 141 yards. No one's going to know that. You just look and you go, who won the game? Who was the quarterback in that game? And that's all that matters. You know, well, that's stupid. I, of course it's stupid. Sports is stupid. I'm saying this as a guy who watches sports every day, hosts a sports show, wakes up every morning, and does sports report. It's always stupid. LaShawn McCoy is always getting in a fight with the cops. You know, Johnny Manziel showing up hungover and hitting his girlfriend. Sports is really stupid. But when you get to watch your favorite player win a Super Bowl, when you get to watch your favorite team win a World Series, as we've done three times in the last six years, it's pretty great. And it makes up for yeah. all of the stupid. It's the best, you know, it's the best TV there is. And I, yeah, it's live. It's great. Anything can I, happen. And sports movies are the worst. Because <laughs> there, there are only two potential outcomes. In a sports movie, either the, the underdog wins or they lose but learn a very important lesson about the world. <laughs> or, or both. They can win and learn a lesson about the world. Right. Um. <laughs> but in sports, sometimes the, the you know, the over, overdog, the... The favorite, you know, the bad guy, the, the New York Knights. Sometimes they win, and sometimes it just sucks. Well, and that's actually, why Bad News Bears is so great. Well, we've seen a third outcome. We've seen uh, a team and a player lose, Cam Newton, and then not learn anything. Yeah. That, well, that, I guess that would be the definition of, a, of the worst sports movie, or maybe like the best sports movie. Underdog or favorite loses, doesn't learn a darn thing, doesn't, doesn't accept uh, uh, other people into his heart. Um, why was yeah. Peyton Manning the player going to Disneyland and not not a uh, Vonnie Bovishon Miller? Uh, <laughs> Racism? No is it uh, offensiveism? Quarterbackism? What what what's the factor there? It's because probably quarterbackism. I mean, the original Disneyland player was an African American man. Okay, so is it Papa Johnism? Would... Is it pizzaism? Like it's <laughs> national socialism. Uh, it's got to be something. Well, at least it's an ethos. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and I think they just wanted to give Peyton Manning as much spotlight as they could, as they could manage, and they yeah, were they not could manage. able. Very good, very good. Well, <laughs> as long, and uh, you know, despite all best efforts, they could not justify giving him the MVP, even though I was almost certain that they were going to. No, no. <laughs> I mean, I was watching that game, and it was the third quarter, and the Broncos were up, and I, I looked over to Derek, and I said. Hey man, game ends right now. Who's your MVP? And he said, unquestionably, Von Miller. And I said, I, I agree. That guy's a monster out there today and has been the entire playoffs. But I think the problem was the NFL sponsored by Budweiser. Peyton Manning drops Budweiser. Miller would have gone Miller time, you know? It might have gone off brand and it might have affected the NFL's financials. So, you yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, they said afterward that um, Peyton did not, you know, did not receive financial consideration for that line. I mean, who, who really cares one way or another? Well, he but. received a kiss from Papa John. <laughs> open yeah, open that's, mouth, that's I think. Uh, thing. The first report, open open mouth on Papa John. Um, I don't know. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think they just wanted to make it Peyton's day and Peyton's Disneyland trip. And, uh, you know, Von Miller can just get, you know, can just enjoy his new Cadillac or whatever. I, yeah, I would love to Maybe be. Maybe that's a baseball no, they get a car. They always get a car. And it's like a car they would never drive. It's like, here's a Chevy Volt. And it's like, dude, <laughs> he's probably got a Bentley. Like, he's, not, he's not worried about this Dodge Charger that you're trying to give him. He's going to give that to his, his nine-year-old kid, you know? <laughs> oh, God. Do you remember when, uh, um, I think it was when Pablo Sandoval won the All-Star Game uh, MVP? All-Star All -Star Game MVP and a really awkward Chevy guy. Uh, gave him a car that was filled with technology or something like that. Uh huh. <laughs> what, what was the punchline? <laughs> this bunch was an awkward moment. No, that it was. It was the most awkward moment where this guy came on screen who had obviously never been on camera before, or was not comfortable being on camera. It was broadcasted to millions and millions of homes and started talking about, you know, extolling the virtues of of the great car they were giving him, and he's like, and it's got lots of uh, of technology, <laughs> like for driving and. <laughs> <laughs> he forgot all the names of everything. Moment. Okay. <laughs> Why? Well, do you? And here's the thing. Do you think Panda still owns that car? Do you think he ever drove that car? Uh, no. I'm sure he gave it away the second he could. <laughs> I'm sorry. The line was technology and stuff. 
Technology and stuff. Well, there's hopefully a lot of stuff in the car, um, especially if you want to make it work. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Ron Rivera's coaching in this game because he's been a pretty good tactician over the years about going for it on fourth down at the right time, going for two at the right time, using his running attack to balance out the deep passing. And I thought the Panthers were a very well-run team this year, especially when you win a lot of close games like that. It comes down to tactical uh, decisions. He burned through both of his challenges in the first half. They didn't run any successful run packages. They ran that triple option once or twice for pretty good success, but didn't really have anything going. And then on top of that, he doesn't go for fourth and one when he has Cam Newton ready to charge through any line or whip around the outside at any given moment. I I just thought he was out coached by Gary Kubiak, and I never thought that would happen. I mean, a lot of things you look back and... You say that it, that somebody coached poorly based on the outcome. You don't have to look back on the outcome and say that you shouldn't use your second challenge with 11 minutes left in the second quarter. Even if you win it, you're I, out of challenges. I just mean that it's really hard to look at this game and look at any game that anybody played against Denver and Denver's amazing defense and know what it was like because you – the mistake that a lot of people, you know, myself, yourself included, throughout the, uh, made throughout the season was thinking, oh, well, this team just needs to come in and do their thing against Denver, and then Denver's not going to score, and then, you know, there you go, Denver loses. Well, when they get but set Denver up destroyed. inside the five twice and get a touchdown, you know, off of a fumble. But Denver doesn't – Denver destroys plans, you know. The, the, the best laid plans against Denver are just, just completely go to crap. I'm sure that at, that what they were looking at was Cam Newton uh, in a game where they could not get any any thing going on the ground, where they looked at Peyton Manning, you know, not doing anything with his offense, and decided that the better chance was to get the ball back. I mean, and in hindsight, that I mean, at the time that would have made sense, and now it still makes sense. You can say, well, Cam can get one yard, but we've seen a lot of Super Bowls and really important playoff games turn on inability to get one yard. So, you know, especially against a formidable defense. Yeah, I just, Ron Rivera made his bones as a coach of the last four or five seasons going for it. You know, they call him Riverboat Ron. The reason his team was successful in close games was because he would go for it on plays like that instead of settling for a punt or settling for a really long field goal a la Jason Garrett of the Cowboys who still kicking 57-yard field goals for no reason. Um, we can move on from that. Uh, pretty, what, what, what would you rate the Super Bowl, scale of 1 to 10, your enjoyment of it? <laughs> uh, just the game itself without yeah. the context of spending time with friends? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was like a 4. Yeah, it's pretty low. I mean, anytime you get a defensive touchdown, that's pretty cool. But you don't want to see the ball yeah. all over the turf in the game. I just don't like fumbly games because hang on to the ball, Mike Tolbert. Yeah, let's see you try to hang on to the ball when, uh, you know, Von Miller and DeMarcus Ware and all those guys are just destroying you in eight different places while somebody else comes and rips the ball out. Of I, I don't want to be destroyed in eight different places, especially by Vonnie Bavashan <laughs> Miller. And that's his full name. Look it up. I'll say it again. Vonnie Bavashan Miller. Uh, Sean Miller, also the coach at Arizona, so maybe named after him. Uh, no more Super Bowl, but let's talk about the Vegas aspect of it. Um, Broncos cover, money line covers, the under was a big winner for people, which is always a big win for Vegas because people tend to bet the over because they like scoring, so they always assume it's going to go over. Uh, Vegas took in $132 million worth of bets in their sports books for the Super Bowl, and that's a record up from $119 million in 2014, so a big increase there. And the American Gambling Association estimates that $4.1 billion were bet on the Super Bowl illegally I looked it up. That's more than the gross domestic product of the country of Liberia. <laughs> Does that impress you at all? Well, everything in Liberia is free. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Um, yeah, so that's a lot of a skrilla to be thrown around. We didn't have a bet on this game, but we definitely had our picks. Um, yeah, and you and I both picked Denver. So No, I, I picked no. Carolina. 
Oh, you did? Yeah. I thought you picked Denver on the show. Nah, I think I picked Carolina. Um, oh, well, then I'm the only one who picked Denver. <laughs> <laughs> Do they have to make gambling legal? Because people just love it so much. I mean, and it's not... Is it a vice? I mean, I know people's lives get ruined by it, but lives, people's lives get ruined by alcohol, and that's legal. You know, people's lives get ruined by um, lots of things that are completely legal, but as long as they're controlled and there are programs to help people who are having issues, you know, I don't see any reason why... Uh, Papa John or, or a guy who lives down the street can't make a little friendly wager with a local sports book or with his other neighbor. You know, I don't really understand what the problem is. Yeah, I mean, you know, would you would you rather have uh, legal gambling or legal marijuana? <laughs> Por okay, no, por que no los dos. Um, I mean, I don't really indulge in, in one of those things. Uh, um, I do love gambling, I will say. Um yeah, I'd rather have I'd rather have the free sports gambling because it's sports, and anytime you're watching a game that's kind of boring, it's so much more fun when you got that little juice on it. Um, yeah, but whenever I want to make a bet, I'll just bet with you. You're my sports book. No, <laughs> I know that, but I, I, you know, I don't always want to take all of your ludicrous bets. Um, okay, well let's let's move on from that. We have one more football story uh, directly. Oh, a couple actually. You're, you're going to miss Marshawn Lynch, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously I was, I'm was i a fan of the 49ers, so I had a lot of nightmares involving Marshawn Lynch, but... Um, Beast Quakes you know, 1 and great, 2. <laughs> yeah, but he was, a, he was a really great player, and he was a local guy, and, you know, he celebrated on the float with Draymond Green when the Warriors won, won the championship. Which is, so yeah, fantastic, having an Oakland yeah. guy, you know, <laughs> come destroy the 49ers. That probably made Oakland fans very happy, Raider fans very happy. Um, when he retired, he just tweeted out a picture of his cleats hanging up. You're a lawyer. You're just entering this profession. When you want to retire, what do you do? How do you show that to the world without words? Uh, it's a, it's a, a necktie and a briefcase. You need a really strong, you need a really strong power cord, though. Okay. You, no, you just use the necktie around the briefcase and hang it from the telephone wire outside your house. Yeah, make it like a lasso. And, <laughs> and it, no, it doesn't, it's not a briefcase. It's, it's an attache case, I think. Okay, well... I don't know what that is, but I it sounds... I an attache case. Well, you, by the time and, you retire, you better. Oh, that's true, and I won't need it anymore. Yeah, but. get that 401k, Danny, or the Roth IRA or whatever thing that I'll never have <laughs> is because I want to be in, in sports media and radio. Um, NFL players won't be allowed... To or sorry, potential NFL players won't be allowed to attend the draft or combine if they have any misdemeanors or felony assault, sexual assault charges. Is that a positive step for football? Um, I Do, mean, does that move your needle at all? It doesn't sound like it does. I, it doesn't really, in the sense that I still don't think that any of these deterrent, these intended deterrent effects, actually are deterrents. I mean. It does have the the upside of potentially keeping people who have those proclivities out of the league, but the question is, do you, you know, if uh, what did you say with pending charges? A any charges whatsoever. There's gonna the NFL is gonna run a full background check on everyone who wants to participate in the NFL Combine, and if it comes up that you have any uh, assault charges, uh, felony or misdemeanor assault or sexual assault charges, you will not be allowed to participate you can still play in the league you just can't go to the combine and you can't go to the draft yeah so uh, i mean and i guess what we're hoping for is that those guys won't end up getting drafted or something like well, that no, I mean, we hope that the guys who deserve and have been good citizens make it at the combine and get drafted over guys who you know screwed up a bunch in college and who didn't take their athletic journey seriously and, and didn't live up to their expectations as the league wants them to be when they're in the league, you know. Um, I mean, this is a way out there, but we saw the the ups and downs of Lawrence Phillips over the last 20 years, and, and look how his life ended. You know, they want players who exemplify, you know, at least halfway decent values, and if you exclude the guys who don't represent that in college from the combine, they're going to get drafted lower, you know, or not at all, and they're going to have to fight harder to earn their chance, and it's going to reward players who were better student athletes and more model citizens who can get a higher draft pick just by being able to go to the combine. I mean, I guess I, I, can, I can see how they want that to happen. If I had more faith in the criminal justice system... And, oh, Danny. Danny. You know, then I, well, Daniel I mean, Zarchi Esquire. 
Well, sure, but it feels like what what's going to happen instead is you're going to have these extremely powerful and influential college football programs leaning on the local district attorney even more not to charge their superstar uh, and the local investigators not doing their job and everything kind of that you saw with the with the horribly botched Jameis Winston rape investigation. Mm-hmm. Oh, you man, know, and the school because, ended up having to pay like 750 k or something to that young woman. Right, and so based on this rule, Jameis Winston would not be barred from the combine, but, but you know, to look at the facts, I mean, there are some pretty sharp indications that he probably did something wrong. Hmm, interesting. So, I thought it was a positive like step. Now, well, it seems like, no, I mean, I think it's a positive step. I just think that, um, you know, as a practical matter, you're – you're probably just going to get a lot of people not get charged because because of the influence and the way you know the way these things flow downhill. So I think it's a good step. I think that it's not going to be a cure all by any means, and I don't think anyone's saying that it will. But hmm. you know, hopefully it will. Hopefully it will. I will and, and the other question is whether you think that you know some uh, I don't know. I don't want to keep saying James Winston, but something, someone exactly like James Winston, let's say, you know, he's about to do something really bad, some sort of assault or sexual assault. You know, are they really going to think like, oh, no, if I do this, I won't be able to go to the combine? Oh, yeah, I won't get drafted, I, you know, because not everyone is a James Winston-like talent where you can't pass on him. But there's guys who have third, fourth, fifth round grades who, if they don't show up to the combine, might get passed by other guys and not get drafted at all. Yeah, I would just. You know, I would assume that the threat of criminal prosecution would already deter those, <laughs> deter those people. But then yeah. again, it what, doesn't, so what, I'm wrong. What can so, you what can you teach knows? kids, I guess? Uh, you're already Grandpa's Archie. Lawyer, Grandpa lawyer's Archie already. Um, don't, <laughs> don't let the world beat you down, my friend. It's a bright, sunshiny place out there. All right, one more football story, and then we'll go to a little break, and then we'll talk about some of our personal flavor flaves. Um, this year's Hall of Fame class, I'm going to read it to you real quick. The, the old guys... The seniors, Ken Stabler, Dick Stanfell, uh, your former owner, Eddie DeBartolo Jr., used to own the 49ers. Huge, huge contributor, contributor to w- the way the league looks now. Um, and 49er fans actually probably wish he was still in charge. Um, and then yep. for the regular players, Brett Favre, Marvin Harrison, Kevin Green, Orlando Pace, and Tony Dungy. Um, a really interesting class there. Uh, Favre's a no-brainer, you have to say, because you know every three or four years you get a quarterback like Favre who becomes eligible, and they just go, they just go right in. He's one of the ten or fifteen best quarterbacks to ever suit up. Definitely one of the toughest, and just had an amazing career. So he's a he's a go. Uh, Marvin Harrison gets a little more controversial. He has the numbers, but was never didn't ever feel like the best receiver in football. And Terrell Owens didn't get in, and I don't know how yeah, to that, feel about that. that. One. I'm bad. Is that bad more the- white, old white columnists legislating their feelings on his brashness? Yeah. I mean, I don't really see a way you can look at his numbers and see the way he impacted the league during his time in the league. Well, they're like, oh, he played for five teams. He- Nobody wanted him around. It was like, yeah, but when they did, they won games. Yeah. I, I mean, I really, I really do think that it's personality keeping him out because I don't think – I don't think anybody can really make the case based on his numbers that he didn't deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. He didn't start the prima donna wide receiver movement, and he didn't finish it. It's not over. You know, look at Deshaun Jackson. You know, look at Chad Ochocinco. Even Steve Smith, I wouldn't call him a prima donna, but he definitely is a lets his a actions. Yeah, psychopath lets his actions uh, overcome him sometimes, and his words uh, do the same. So. I just I grew up watching T.O. You know, he came in the league when I, you know, we were about nine, ten years old, and played for eighteen seasons, and he was just always there. And when he was great, he'd catch a ball over the middle, he would shed tacklers like they were nothing, and then he would prance into the end zone. He was almost untouchable for a few seasons when he was in Dallas, or or that twenty reception game he had for the Forty ers You know, he was absolutely untouchable. He had that the catch two against Green Bay, which I remember uh, as a significant part, beating Brett Favre in, in the NFC playoffs. So I don't really see a way you can keep him out. His numbers are there, and he defined an era of wide receivers. Whether you want to consider that a good era or a bad era, he defined it. So if you let a guy like yeah. Billy White Shoes Johnson into the Hall of Fame and Terrell Owens can't get in, that's ridiculous. 
Yeah, I mean, so I, this is where my no, my knowledge of the NFL Hall of Fame fails, but uh, does he stay on the ballot, or how does that work? No, he, he stays on the ballot, and he'll get in. This is just them sending him a message saying, we see you, T.O., we got tired of hearing you, we didn't like the Sharpie, we didn't like the star, you know, we didn't like you doing crunches, and he's also a victim of the way media works now. If he came through in the 70s and just said a bunch of cool things, they're like, oh, he's like Muhammad Ali. But now the 24-hour news cycle happens and all of a sudden there's T.O. in his driveway doing crunches and his dumb agent Drew Rosenhaus is just spouting off at the mouth whereas in the 1970s there was no outlet for that there was no way for anyone to know who was a jerk or who was a faker and who was not genuine you know all that stuff didn't matter because all you did was see them play on the field maybe hear a couple quotes in the paper but that was it so I feel like he's a victim of his era uh, and and the, he wasn't even around for most of social media, which is another another thing entirely that we'll we'll have to get to in fifteen twenty years when those guys are up for for Hall of Fame induction. But Tio's got to be in. Yeah, I know. I mean, we we definitely agree on that. I, I, Isaac Bruce and Tory Holt too. I agree with Mike Martz. I think maybe maybe one of those guys gets in over Tio, but I think all three of those guys should be in the Hall of Fame. Okay, let's take a quick break and tell you about Ninety Nine Bottles, our returning sponsor. Located in downtown Santa Cruz on Walnut Avenue between Pacific and Cedar, right in the heart of downtown. It's your premier destination for drinking, dining, and I can't think of any more D words, uh, doing sports things. Um, <laughs> full bar, uh, over 100 drink options on the menu. They have a lot of rare and cool and imported beers that you can try. Um, they'll let you sample the stuff on draft. The food is delicious. It's a wonderful place to hang out. And like I said, it's right in the heart of downtown. So go make a trip down there for lunch or for brunch or for dinner. Um, just a fantastic place overall. Thank you to 99 Bottles for sponsoring us today. All right, Zarchi, you have your pick. NBA or San Francisco Giants? Uh, let's go Giants. <laughs> let's go Giants. I knew what you were going to pick. We'll get to NBA looking at the clock right now to see how much time we have left. Let's get to the Giants. Uh, Brandon Belt finally signs a contract. It's a one-year, $6.2 million deal. It's his la is, this is his last year of arbitration, correct? Um, we're I'll get back to you on that. We're, we're better than this, Danny. We know this stuff. Uh, it was 200 I don't know Danny speculated about baseball. I know. This is a common theme. Uh, we once re recorded a podcast in a car. That's how... That's how hardcore we are. Uh, Belt is, are, is arbitration eligible again in 2017. Okay, again in 2017. They tried to ink him to an extension, um, and talks were so far apart that they just completely broke down, and it looked like they might be headed actually to arbitration. Um, but they signed the one-year deal to avoid it the day of the arbitration hearing. It was less than Belt wanted, more the Giants wanted to give him. That's pretty much how arbitration works. Do you think they're gonna just let him go in in a season and a half? No, I, not at all. I think they're. I think Brandon Belt. I think the Giants know that Brandon Belt is a very uh, valuable piece of their team, and I think that very few pe very few other people know that. You know, so maybe maybe the Giants let him taste for agency. I kind of doubt that, but I think that they're just gonna lock him up. I mean, he's a fan favorite. I think, or, you know, I'm sure there's still people out there who think that he's a bum, but he's a fan favorite. He plays really good defense, and they don't have an immediate replacement for him at first unless Buster Posey moves over there permanently. I was going to say, here's what he's not about to do. Here's what everybody and nobody wants to talk about. The fact that it will probably be Buster Posey moving over that will be the reason Brandon Belt gets let go. Um, well, but if that happens, I think it's more likely Bell becomes a left fielder than exits the team. I, I don't know if you want to start putting a guy in the outfield full-time when he turns 30 or when he turns 29 or whatever he's going to be. Because um, Posey, this time two years from now, will be 30, and it will be a pretty good time to move him to a less you know demanding and exhausting position, especially if you want to get full value out of his bat the rest of his career. So, you know, Belt's 27 now. So, yeah, I guess in two seasons, moving him to left field wouldn't be too bad, but he's not a prime candidate to play the outfield. We've seen it. It's not great. It, it's not great, but it's not terrible. I mean, he's been, he's extremely athletic and has a good arm. And, you know, he's, he's certainly not the worst left fielder that it's ever been on the Giants. And, I mean, worst by defense or, or by hitting. And I think that if... 
Posey does end up going to first, I mean, one the one thing that we know is that it's going to be on his own terms. It's not going to be because the Giants have decided that he should become a first baseman. Well, I so, mean, what's the difference you know, at this point? It seems to be that, that Bochy, Posey, and the organization are all on the same page as far as everything. You know, I think they it's just a mutual trust that runs so deep you don't even question it at this point. You know, you can say... You know, guys who have broken off badly with the organization like Pablo Sandoval, that was never there. There was never good communication. There was never trust because they just couldn't do it because Panda had never proven himself to be trustworthy uh, the way that Posey has. And Posey so ingrained in the team right now that they will, yeah, do whatever he wants. But at some point there has to be a conversation of do you want to play till you're 37 or do you want to play till you're 34? Yeah, no, I mean, that's true. Uh, I mean, there was also the speculation, maybe this is just by the fans, it was almost certainly just by the fans, that maybe he would move to third base, kind of following Joe Torre. Uh, well, because I, he'd been a shortstop in his, you know, in his former life. And all. I mean, everybody was a shortstop in their former life, but um, well, that's tough because, you know, when you're, when you're looking at the way the Giants are constructed right now, it's the young, cheap infield that makes everything so good. It's why they could go out and sign big-ticket pitchers. It's why in a couple seasons they'll probably be able to sign a big-ticket, you know, outfielder or, or whatnot. But having Matt Duffy there at third base at cost control is perfect. But Belt's about to hit free agency and get really, really expensive because there's going to be a sabermetrically in team client out there, inclined team out there that looks at him and goes, wow, this is one of the best first basemen in, in baseball once you take him out of AT&T Park. And they're going to take him out of AT&T Park, and he's going to be productive. So I think they're going to let him go. And, I, and Grant Brisby agrees with me, and I agree with him. And, you know, that goes around in our own weird McCovey Chronicles circle of trust. But, uh, yeah, I, I think he's going to be gone. I think the fact they couldn't reach an extension now, you think they're going to reach one next season? I think they go to arbitration again. Uh, I mean, it's... I just don't want him to leave. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no one does. We we argued so hard for him, and we had, to, you know, the free belt movement, and, you know, we were always pro-belt guys because his strikeouts were slumpy-shouldered, but we didn't care because he hit home runs. He hit a lot of doubles. He was, a you know, a good base runner, really good defender. So we were always on belt side, but eventually it just becomes, you know, wouldn't you rather have Buster Posey and Matt Duffy? And that's pretty much what I would say. I'd rather have those two guys and maybe Andrew Susak's ready to catch by then. That's a pretty good threesome to say, okay, Brandon, greener pastures, go ahead. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, it's I talked to you into a it. terrible idea. Just admit but, I talked to you, you into don't it. Want, <laughs> no, you didn't talk me into it. You, you, you convinced me that it might happen, but I still don't think it's a good idea. Okay. I think that the Giants don't have, uh, I mean, the one thing that they do have in the Myers is kind of starting pitching, uh, one too many shortstops and power outfielders. And we don't know if the power outfielders are actually going to translate their power into the majors. You know, Jared Parker and Mac Williamson. We don't know if the starting pitchers are going to pay off, obviously, and because they're all several years away, and we don't know if, you know, the several shortstops are going to stay at shortstop. But unless you're going to move Mac Williamson to first base and count on him to just explode in the way that, uh, you know, that all the prospects did last year, you want belt. Bell is the best option there, and he's going to be worth the money. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. Like I said, I think some team's going to come with a godfather offer and pay him more than the Giants will because the Giants have never truly seen his value because they're not as analytically oriented as some other teams. Uh, let's talk about Gaylord Perry. Yeah, I, I also don't think that's true. But um, I don't yeah, think I'd just like to point out that, that uh, Fangraphs.com mm -hmm. put Brandon Bell's outfield defense at uh, – in 96 and a third innings last year, he had negative 0.4 UZR, which is a measure of range. So mm -hmm. that worked out to negative 8.7 per 150 over the year. I mean, your fans don't really, uh, your listeners don't care about this. but Our listeners, kind of Danny. Our listeners. <laughs> he's a slightly below average defensive outfielder, but he's certainly not uh, the worst first baseman you could put in left field. Let's just put it that way. Okay, well, let's put a pin in that, and let's talk about a guy who would have been terrible if you put him in left field. His name was Gaylord Perry. He's a Giants legend, played 10 seasons in the Bay. He's getting his own statue outside AT&T Park. And, Danny, what I want you to do right now is name the other four Giants players who have statues outside our favorite place on Earth. Uh, let's see, Orlando Cepeda, Willie Mays, Juan Marichal, and... 
Oh, Danny. Uh, Danny, you know this guy. You're his buddy. You guys are buddies. And William McCovey. You guys go way back to spring training 2011. <laughs> you guys are homies. You have his number. No, you don't have his number. Uh, finally, finally, a white guy gets a statue. Am I right? <laughs> finally, a white athlete gets a prominent statue somewhere in the San finally, Francisco Bay Area. Finally, something good happens. I know. I can't believe it took this long. Uh, no, we're just kidding. Um, those are all great giants. And Gaylord Perry gave us 10 great seasons in the San Francisco era. They really emphasize that outside of AT&T Park, that guys had to contribute uh, mostly because there's no, there's no Bill Terry statue. There's no uh, Mel Ott statue, Christy Mathewson, you know, all these guys who were great giants in New York. They've really emphasized the San Francisco Giants, and that's, that's pretty good to get 10 seasons yeah. of a Hall of Famer and, and have him have a statue. How close are we to a Bond statue? I think that's got to happen. I, I do think it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen sooner rather than later, uh, certainly with Bond's back in the majors, I mean, uh, coaching for Miami, and kind of regaining his, uh, his legitimacy in baseball, you know, in, in the annals of baseball history. I mean... It might happen after the Hall of Fame. I mean, after he's he's either in the Hall of Fame or off the ballot. But I would put, I would bet on sooner. So you know, within the next eight years. Yeah, especially with how much money they can cash in on having Barry Bonds statue night, and and we all know that humor is just tragedy plus time. And eventually, we're all gonna we're all already starting to look back on the steroid era and laugh. You know, the indignant opinions are becoming fewer and far between. Uh, the vitriol against Maguire, Sosa, Bonds, Palmero is starting to go away, and we're all just giggling about it because it happened so long ago. It's just funny now. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just that ridiculous time when everybody injected stuff into their butts and, you know, hit 90 <laughs> home runs a year. We're going to fill our butts so big. We're going to fill our Okay, that's too much. It's always sunny. Um, all right, we're at the portion of our show where we bring on our producer, Tori to tell us what's been happening that's kind of on the lighter side, a little bit goofier side of sports. Danny, you want to stay with us? I do. Okay, course. before Tori launches into her topics, I want to talk about this with her because she watched the Super Bowl, and, you know, I want to get your feeling, not on the game because we broke down the game, that's fine. I want to get all of our feelings about the commercials and the halftime show. Tori, what, what did you think of the halftime show? Coldplay, really? Uh, dude, I was so upset. You know, I understand the point of the Halftime Act is to get people who aren't watching the game, the few remaining people not watching the game, to want to jump in and That's watch the game. That's what Beyonce is for. I, <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> I, we, did, we did need more Beyonce. Chris Martin is so boring. Coldplay is so boring. Parents are asleep. Kids are asleep. Old people have died since Coldplay started performing. It, it was just horrible. You know nothing, Chris Martin. Yeah, and, and Beyonce falls down or nearly falls down. Oh, she saved it, though. Oh, man. It was not the best halftime show. The, the only highlight was Beyonce and Bruno Mars. The Coldplay was just so boring. I liked what they were doing with the, ca the up-close yeah, camera work. That was really cool. It was really the, well shot. The guy doing the free cam was fantastic. It, it almost looked fake. It it was just very well yeah. produced. The other thing, well, big ups to Beyonce for having the guts to do a new song at the Super Bowl that no one heard until two days before the Super Bowl. <laughs> and you know, there's you know, you know, people out there already singing along to the lyrics about how she's got hot sauce in her purse. I, I don't know. I, I don't really understand the career of Beyonce anymore. Red Lobster. Red Lobster. I don't know. Red I, Lobster. I'm so out. I'm out of the. I'm out of the loop now. Uh, I still think pink is relevant. Um, the color and the and the artist, but uh, Danny, what did you think of the commercials? Was there one that stood out for you? <laughs> well, it, it's pretty easy to pick which one was the worst one. Hey, we're all. talking about Puppy Baby Monkey. P Puppy Monkey Baby. Puppy Monkey Baby. <laughs> really, not the Super Bowl Babies. Uh, the Super Bowl Babies is the best one. Those kids were <sighs> that, that adorable. Oh, the kids were adorable, but, but the commercial itself was awful. The New York Giants one. All those kids are just at the age now where they're they're you put them in oversized clothes and it's the cutest thing ever. They're yeah. all wearing beanies and like one kid's got the beanie half over her eye because she's just like so cold. And I thought those commercials were adorable. But what happened to like the true era of Super Bowl commercials now? Now, what what two athletes or fans had to reproduce to create the puppy monkey baby? 
<laughs> that thing's been on YouTube for like a week and a half, though. Uh, yeah, because they do that. They release the commercials early, so it's you know less of a surprise when they come on, which then is never the good. what's the point of watching the Super Bowl for I, the commercials? I, I don't know. I think people just get so invested in the hype that they're willing to watch it, and that's all these people want. The advertisers and companies just want eyeballs. Yeah. And so while there's Super Bowl hype going on, they want to put the content out there. Um, Danny, any other comments from the ephemera of the Super Bowl? Um, I will say that the the wiener dogs with the ketchup commercial. Oh, that was so cute. Oh, they're like dressed. They're dressed as hot dog and uh, mustard and, and ketchup. Hot dogs and yeah, a bunch of people dressed as mustard and ketchup. And, okay. Well, you, know, you just you, you want to be there and play with the dogs. And, well, you, you know, would you would relish the opportunity. Drunk me, puppy boy. <laughs> drunk me may have uh, started crying watching that commercial really? because it was so cute. <laughs> Oh, we're going to have to have a Super Bowl party next year for Coach's Decision. <laughs> That'll be a fun time. Okay, Tori, launch into your topics. we got about seven minutes, so we got some time to burn. First off, Von Miller has a younger brother named Vincenzi. Vincenzi? V-I-N-S-Y-N-Z-I-E. Vincenzi. Like Vincenzo, but... Wrong. Your throat is clogged. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're saying it nasally. Vincenzi. Yeah. Well, I, I had he, to share does that. Does he play football? Uh, no, he's a tattoo artist. Okay, because there were a pair of brothers who used to play football in the league, and everyone knows Champ Bailey, because Champ Bailey's probably a Hall of Fame-bound defensive back. But And that's his real name, Champ. His brother was a linebacker for Detroit named Boss Bailey. <laughs> These kids were set up for success, Champ and Boss. It's like, wow. Uh, Thomas, yeah. I, I, I hate to take the wind out of your sails here. Champ Bailey's real name was Roland. What? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> He's looking that up right now. I know. Now I'm Googling. No, I, I wasn't sure that it was his real first name. Rodney Boss Bailey and Roland Chant Bailey. Junior. Oh, yeah, sorry. Junior. Oh, yeah. Von Miller is a, was named after his dad. Okay. Who's also Von Miller. Okay. But real name, Vonnie. It's not short for, for Von, yeah, it's Von, Vonald or uh, Vincent or <laughs> Vincenzi. <laughs> Thought you would enjoy that. Yeah, I did. Next one. All right. So uh, here's the warm fuzzy. Recovering Peyton Manning needed a throwing partner, so he used a special teams rookie, Jordan Taylor. Taylor was running two practices a day, one with Peyton in the morning and then practice with the actual team later in the day. Peyton was so thankful that when Jordan Taylor said, I don't have a suit, can I, like, borrow one of your hand-me-downs? Peyton called his suit guy and got him a suit, like a fancy Italian suit. Just for the Super Bowl. So what? What's Peyton Manning's suit guy? Is that is that the men's warehouse dude? Is that guy still alive? I guarantee it. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least Manning didn't get. So wait, you had to to throw to play catch with Peyton Manning is not that exhausting anymore. You you run ten yard out patterns and twelve yard curls. It's really not as but, exhausting as it used to be. But for a rookie, like, how cool is it to like have your own special practice section se session with Peyton Manning? I mean. What would it take? What would it take for me to get one of those Manning Italian suits? <laughs> <laughs> Be his lawyer. And and it's funny that the guy's last name was Taylor. Mm -hmm. That he didn't have a suit. Just just want to throw that out there. All right, next story. Speaking of Ocho Cinco, he came up earlier. Uh, what was the, What was the Chinese name he wanted to come up with? Panda friend. <laughs> I think he wanted to be Chad Panda friend. So uh, on a. Uh, Mike and Mike interview earlier mm -hmm. this week, or uh -huh. was it this morning? Uh, it happens in the middle. We're on the West yeah. Coast, so it starts at like 3.30 yeah. a.m. I used to stay up to try and watch Mike and Mike in the morning the, the night before. I hadn't gone to bed yet. I always considered that a treat, so I, we're way off yeah. on the West Coast. So Ocho Cinco used to soak his sprained ankles in his teammate's warm urine. Okay. Why not just warm water? Uh, I mean, it is warm water to a degree. 98 degrees, I guess. Well, he would warm it up further. <laughs> this is... Do you need some buttermilk or something? Rub your... I, I, uh, I mean, there's MMA fighters and, and, and jiu-jitsu practitioners who cycle through their own urine uh, as part of their training routine. So I know Loyota Machida, who's a very successful former champ in the UFC, has gone through bouts of drinking his own urine. So I... I guess this doesn't it's surprise sterile? me. Yeah. I mean, he also drank, ate McDonald's every morning. So, you know, he can't use his own urine because that stuff's contaminated. <laughs> Might not pass a drug test. All right, Danny, any, any further thoughts on P-Gate? <laughs> Uh, just that uh, Panda Friend was actually Metal World Peace. Oh, that was Metal World Peace? Okay, I'm sorry. 
I can't I can't keep ridiculous people changing their name to ridiculous things uh, separate. <laughs> well, I guess there is no football league in China for Ocho Cinco to go play in, so that that makes sense. I think actually, you know what it was? He wanted to change it to Chad and then whatever eight five is in in Chinese. So I think that might have been uh, what I was remembering on that. All right, Tori. My favorite, my favorite is that Ocho Cinco is not even how you say eighty five. Oh no, nice. Ochen, yeah, Ochenta y Cinco. I don't even speak Spanish, and I know that much. Uh, All right, Tori. Uh, nice job, Chad. <laughs> the Chad. So, other than T.O., no NFL player in history has scored a touchdown against all 32 teams. T.O. has done it at least twice. So, he essentially wow. holds the record twice over. Well, here's the thing. It, that is part of him playing for five different teams. He got to play in the AFC and the NFC. I guess he played most of his career in the NFC. Um, that's a longevity thing. Um, as much as anything, it's also the high volume of touchdowns he's got. I, I can't believe Jerry Rice never did that. Uh, I can't believe Randy Moss never did that. Those guys scored so many touchdowns. And put the guy in the Hall of Fame. I don't care if he pulled out a pen after he scored a touchdown. Joe Horn once put a phone in the goalpost and pretended to talk on it. Like, it's funny. It's funny. Half the fun is watching people celebrate. I used to love the bob and weave that the Rams used to do or they'd throw the ball up in the air and then everybody would explode when the ball hit the ground. That stuff's fun. I mean, it's not hurting anybody. Danny? Yeah, I mean, I, I will refer you to, you to last week's comments about uh, which which taunting moves are okay and which are just designed to, to show someone up. And I think T.O. pushed a little far in the other direction. I... I I don't think it's a reason to keep him out of the Hall of Fame. Chad, Chad Johnson once used a pylon to putt the football. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was the height of it for me. He's putting. I don't think he ever played golf. Um, Tori's got more stories, but I have one. I watched today the video with Tori of LeBron James passing the ball into D'Angelo uh, Russell's beans. And D'Angelo yeah, went no down hard. That was, uh, there's no way that was accidental. Oh, the best part? <laughs> Apparently D'Angelo watched it after the game and just laughed because it was. he was like, how can you not? Oh, he went down like a heap. That was a that was a, a vicious pass too. LeBron throws some hard passes, and that was just that was just straight in the beans. It that was that was a fastball. It's coach's decisions, opinion, uh, a show decision that we love when people get hit in the beans. Just not us, right, Danny? <laughs> Who doesn't no, love those? No, not not us, not us. Never us, Tori. You can get hit in the beans. I want it's that. Fine. I want that to be the takeaway from this show. Not in the beans. All right, Tori. One more quick one. Uh, Notre Dame football player Corey Robinson is running for studi body, student body president, makes an endorsement video with appearances from Tony Parker, Tim Duncan, Justin Tuck, and John Bon Jovi. Give it to him. How's this kid got that much swing? He's living on a prayer. He's slippery wow. when wet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully he's not wanted dead or alive.